religion, spiritual gifts. This is the last of the three-part uh, teaching series. We did spiritual gifts in Romans, spiritual gifts in Corinthians, now spiritual gifts in Ephesians. How many here love chaos? Oh my God. <laughs> chaos, there's not a whole lot of good to say about it. Um, it may feel like freedom, but uh, in music, if you get a hundred member symphony orchestra and there is no conductor and there is no coordination and everybody just plays as they want to, when they want to, uh, it just all, it doesn't matter, it just all ends up sounding, it doesn't do anything for anybody. If in the Parkland, Tacoma, Puyallup, Yagarber area, it will include Kirkland and Linwood up there, uh, if all of the law enforcement suddenly disappeared. Uh, all, all law and order was gone. Uh, whatever problems we have with it, you take it away, we got a problem or two. Uh, it's, it's not freedom. Personally, I would have my little gun, shotgun. I'd be sitting in my closet with my wife, <laughs> waiting to get out of town real quick, we'll go somewhere else. So God is a God of the order. He's not a God of disorder. Whatever problems there are with order, they're not his problems. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. It's interesting how righteousness and peace couple together in Scripture. The kingdom of God is righteousness, what? Peace. And then joy follows. Righteousness, peace. Uh, righteousness and peace. Kiss. The Bible says, righteousness and peace kiss. The fruit and the effect of righteousness is peace, confidence and quietness forever. So when things are right between us and God, we have peace. And, and God's bringing our whole life into the fruit of righteousness, which, bring, which is bringing uh, peace into it. And there's order in all the congregations of God. So much so, Paul is saying, if anyone does not recognize that there's order in the church, and they ignore it, they'll be ignored. And in effect, what Paul was saying, because he's talking about prophets that were saying, I got it, the Spirit's making me, you know? And, but they were not recognizing, uh, and so Paul was telling the church leaders, hey, uh, if they will not recognize order, then you ignore them, okay? So important to God. Whatever issues we have with government, God has the ultimate government. Now, our problem with government is that it, it tends to be self-serving to those that hold the power. As long as we have the flesh in this world, government's going to be a problem for us to some degree. And we're going to be a problem for government because we have the self, same, uh, self outside of Christ, self-serving uh, nature that government leaders have. Uh, the flesh is just a problem. And, but however, government itself is a good thing. God is government. Uh, authorities, God is the ultimate authority. God's not against authority. Rulers, leaders, God is the ultimate ruler. God is the ultimate leader. So the problem is not in rulers, leaders, authorities, government. The problem is with how the flesh misuses these things. And so we gain a distaste because we've run into it too often in, in the world among men. So Paul here is saying to Titus, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might, say it with me, would you? Put in order. So that you might put in order. And that put in order in the Greek means to uh, stand up straight, uh, to make up right, to make straight. And so you can picture somebody running through a house and just kind of taking the turned over lap and setting it up and kind of putting things back in order. So Titus had to go through Crete, which was about 200 miles long and about 20, 30 miles wide. It was an island just off of uh, Greece. It would be like uh, the I-5 corridor coming up Western Washington from Vancouver up to Bellingham, about that, that big. And now you go through this whole area uh, Titus, and you set things in order how? Because when Paul went through the first time, he left certain things undone, appointing elders in every town. So the appointment of elders set things in order, 
and, uh, and God likes order. He's not a God of disorder. He's a God of freedom, not a God of disorder. He's got a peace, but not a God of disorder. So, in church life, people will say, well, the body of Christ, the church is when two or three gather together, and I have to say technically true. If two or three Christians meet, they're having church. Anytime we see each other on the street and say, hi, we've just had church. We're having church together. It's the gathering of God's people, and all it takes is two or three in his name. However, that church is the application of the word in its broadest sense, in its loosest sense. When two or three are gathered together, is that church? Yes, it is church. Not very well ordered yet. A few things lacking yet. Not well formed yet, but it is church. So it's kind of like the zygote. It's kind of like the, you know, it's not quite an embryo yet. You get two or three people together, yeah, we're church, but we're not well formed yet. So you get your Bible study going. And now, now you're just, you're moving along. And finally, you get a pastor and you go, yay! <laughs> Game is on. Uh, we have a liftoff. And so you have your pastor and this thing gets born. And, it, and all of it's church. The whole thing is church. But it's church coming into order. It's church taking form. Now, I know what I'm, I'm actually teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. So, uh, so all of you people that are afraid of law and order coming down in the church, just, be, just bear with me a little bit. We'll be fine today. We're going to get there. But we're in Ephesians, so we're, we're prepping it for you here a little bit. You get a small leadership team, and now you are a church that's kind of, you're, you're a young kid, you know. And so we are a, we're kind of in this position right now. This is who we are. Now, are we a full-fledged church? Yeah, we are. But we've got a lot of things to be set in order yet. It's, we're not all there yet. So uh, then we hit the teenage years. And that means that all the saints are beginning to be operative in the gifts of the Spirit. You're, you're getting the prophecy and tongues going. You're getting the healing. You're getting the serving going. You're getting it all going. And you got the deacons, and you got the elders, and you even have some fivefold ministry starting to develop out of your eldership and all that. And you're going, now you're pretty cool stuff, you know. Now we are a cool church. That's where it's happening, okay? But actually, this is what I'm waiting for. This is what I can't wait to see. It, it, we tend to go with the, the design or we go with the power, and we haven't figured out how to get the two together. We tend to like structure or we tend to like life. But we haven't figured out how to put it all together yet in a way that makes it work, like God has. It's interesting, when the law was here, we were all immature. We were babies, the Bible says. But when faith came, we became mature. We became adult, okay, through faith. Now, it's interesting, babies and children, they are all about demand. You can't help it. They have a lot of needs. But when you become mom, now you're all about supply. Because now you're capable. You have the capacity. God is looking for a grace-based, finished work resting, Jesus-focused and Jesus-centered, power demonstrating, Holy Spirit-driven, yeah. yeah. ordered, structured, well-formed, well-designed, wisely managed body of Christ. With life and energy and power that's downright, in a sense, scary. I mean, this is not natural. This has got to be the Holy Spirit at work. But in the midst of that, you have all the parts. You have all the pieces. You have the elders. You have the deacons. You have the saints operating in all their gifts. You have you have, you have the structure as well. I, I believe that God is looking for a church that has such a moving of, of, of the parts, the operating parts of the church. See, the body of Christ, you don't want disorder. You know, there, there's got to be the parts receiving a coordinating uh, directives from the head or else if every part were just shooting off, if every muscle were just firing anytime it decided to. Then, then you can say, freedom! Not, not so free. You can't even get up, can't even walk, can't even move. 
But God is doing such a wonderful thing. I believe the wisdom of it is going to be awesome. And it's only fleshly government that oppresses and enslaves. But if it's government by the Spirit of God, I will tell you, it'll never be freer. Amen. You'll never be freer than when God's order comes into play because of the nature of the one who's in charge. He frees us. And so there's going to be an internal strengthening of what the body of Christ is. Then we're going to affect things locally. And as it has all of the functioning parts, it'll go translocal. Now, an interesting verse in Hebrews chapter 8, that the Old Testament prophets, not prophets, but priests, serve at a sanctuary that is, and listen to this, if you get this verse today and let it hook in your mind, it'll help you down the road greatly. That the Old Testament sanctuary and priesthood, it only served as a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. That is why. Because that thing that they built was only a little toothpick model. Uh, just a little object lesson. Not even for them, for us who are the church. It was only a representation of what is in heaven. And the angel told John in chapter 21, 22, come on up here. I'm going to show you the church. I'm going to show you the people of God. She is the wife of the Lamb. She is the city of God. She is the tabernacle of God. And she's coming down out of heaven. That's the church. That's the real deal. All of this was just a demonstration to teach us about what God has made us. And because it's a model, then that is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tab tabernacle. And this is repeated several times in the law. See to it, Moses that you make everything, what? According to the pattern shown you on the mountain. God had an idea. God's a decorator. He's a designer. You think Moses good. Have you been around our house? God knows the colors he wants. You know, he, was, he, he spent six chapters in Exodus going in detail, I want the ten pegs to be this way. He, he didn't leave the ten pegs to Moses. I want the spoons to be this way. I want every stitch and every thread, and he designated it all. Every post. He said, do this, and he goes 225 verses of do it this way, and this way, and this way, and this way, and this way. And you had just promised God, I'm going to read the Bible, I'm not going to leave any out, I'm going to go from Genesis to Revelation. And you died in the middle of that tabernacle. <laughs> God, I cannot read this thing. It goes on and on. And then you know what he does? He comes back and gives you six more chapters, 220 more verses. And it says, and so Moses made the loops this way. And so he drove in the ten pegs this way. And so he took the thread and stitched it that way. And he goes through and he redundantly resays everything that he had just lined out bit by bit. And you go, what has this got to do with Monday on the job? What has this got to do with life? And God's making the point, hey, this is about the real that's in heaven. And I want you folks to understand I've got purpose, I've got order, I've got structure, I've got design. No, I'm not looking for 12 apostles that will actually be foundations laying under the wall. No, it's not. It's about the apostles, but it's, 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 not, it's not really a cube. It's not. But, but tell you what, in Revelation we get there. And this angel that's talking, John says, the one who spoke with me has a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. You angel, you take this rod and you go out and you measure the whole thing. Is it what I want it to be? It's amazing. I'm not against structure as long as it's God's. In the church, there are saints. God says so. It's all of us. A subset, and I'm not dealing with deacons, we'll come back. A subset now is elders. We're just going to give you a quick overview. Elders, 
Among the elders are some five, what we'll call fivefold. This is the Ephesians 5. This is where we're coming in. Ephesians, Ephesians gifts. Ephesians 4. And then among them is uh, what I'll call the angelos. It's uh, if God wanted to send a letter to cross over like he did with John the Apostle he would, in Revelation to the churches, he would send the letter to cross over to the messenger of the church and he's on 118th Street in Puyallup. And so the letter wouldn't be sent to an angel in heaven, it would be sent to the messenger of the church. So God's form of getting things done has always been plurality of leadership in a group and mutual submission. It's never been a lone ranger. It's never been a one man show. It's always been team leadership and mutual submission. But then there's always been one primarily responsible in that team. So you have Moses and the elders of Israel, but you always have Moses. You have David and the mighty men, but you always have David. You have Jesus and the disciples, but you always have Jesus. You have Paul and his ministry team, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy, Epaphroditus, but you always have Paul. You have the Godhead, Father, Son, but you always have the Father. So God always believes in this group, leadership, mutual submission, Father submitting to all, and yet it comes back to the Father again. That's how God is ordering his church. Ephesians 4, Christ himself Game some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists. Now, I can read your thoughts. Do not go, oh, there we go. Don't, don't in your heart tell me, Bob, don't go there, okay? Hang on. This, this is important for us to get. There will be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. When he ascended on high, some people call these the ascension gifts. The word gifts is grace. Graces. You want to talk grace? This is grace. God, God gave these as grace to the church. Take your hand. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Would you do it with me? Apostles, prophets. One more time. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Quick overview. Apostles, we're beyond the 12 in the Bible, not limited to the 12. Barnabas and Paul were apostles. Can you receive that? Okay, now if nothing else, that tells that apostleship went beyond the 12 that followed Jesus. Paul and Barnabas were apostles. And Dronicus and Junia, by the way, Junia is a female form, whatever you want to do with that, it's a female form of the word. But Andronicus and Junia were exceptional among the apostles. Uh, Apollos was an apostle. Christ's four brothers, including James, was, were apostles. Epaphroditus was an apostle. Silvanus and Timothy were apostles. Christ himself, the Bible says, he's the apostle of our faith. So in, in the New Testament, you have at least 24, 25-ish apostles mentioned by name, let alone others referred to. So the apostolic ministry exists today. Now, again, you'll have the flesh taking over certain truths and misusing them. So we gain a distaste because we, we find self-important people in ministry. Well, I am Apostle Bishop, His Holiness, the Son of God Himself, I, I, but very humbly speaking. And we build their thrones, you know, and, and so forget all that. That's the flesh, okay? But don't throw out order just because some people have misused it. The work and the ministry of an apostle is essentially to build and father churches, to establish doctrine, to establish it, to perform signs and wonders. All these are parts of the work and ministry of an apostle. Prophet, in Acts chapter 21, Philip had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Verb, prophesied. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. So it's one thing to prophesy, we can all do that. It's another thing to have the gift of prophecy where it's just your forte, it's a strength. But it's another thing to be a prophet. Now this Agabus had been around 25 years earlier when Paul was just saved. He had come up from Jerusalem to Antioch and he had a prophecy that the whole world is gonna suffer famine. Do you remember that? That was this guy, Agabus. 
Paul was just a brand new Christian. But the whole world is going to suffer famine. And now, 25 years later, he visits uh, Philip's house. Paul is just ready to head to Jerusalem to be captured. And this prophet comes in. Now, the reason he says this is because you had daughters who prophesied. They had the gift of prophecy. But it took the man in the office. It took the man who was the prophet to come in and tie, bring in the heavy-duty stuff. It took a prophet. So the prophets do that. They bring in the, the strong word of the Lord. And so the apostle is to Logos, the establishing doctrine, what prophet is to Rhema. And, and it's interesting that they're both foundations of the church, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ the cornerstone. But because they both are specialists in the word of God, one with more of an emphasis on doctrine, the other with more of an emphasis on the spoken word of God. But they're both word foundational anchor ministries for the church. So that's apostle, prophet, evangelist. One, one mistake we have is that evangelizing is just to unsaved people outside the church. But the gift of an evangelist to the church is to equip God's people too. It's not to go out and save the unsaved. It's to equip you to go out and save the unsaved. Or, in these days, equip you to preach the good news to the church that needs to be believe the gospel. See, we have as much of a ministry to the saved people as we do to the unsaved because they need to hear about the good news of Christ. Then the pastor, the word means literally shepherd, guard, guide, tend, feed, fold. That's the shepherd. He does the, the nitpicking, the flea work with all the sheep. And then you have, oh, while I'm at that, in, the, in our culture, and it, we need a, it just helps to understand what's scripture and what's our tradition, because sometimes we don't know. We take any leader of the church and we toss the word pastor on them. What does the word pastor mean? It just means you're a leader or the leader of the church. However, in the Bible, it never says that. The, ch the chief guy, the, the one who is part of a team and mutually submitted with them, however, Buck stops there. And, if, and so the Anglos, whatever you want to call him, he might be an apostle, he might be a prophet, he might be a pastor, he might be a teacher, he might be an evangelist. And so sometimes in some churches they go, man, this pastor isn't very pastoral. Well, it may be because he's not a pastor. Now you call him a pastor because he's, he's the key leader in that church. But he may be more of a teacher than he is a pastor. Etc. Etc. Okay. Some are more evangelist. So the teacher to instruct, explain, and expound. Now a little bit about these gifts in Ephesians as compared to Romans and Corinthians. How many are with me so far? Okay, hang in there. Okay. Galatians 1. Paul an apostle, not from men. Paul an apostle. Paul, that word means something. It's for a reason. Paul an apostle, not from men or through man but through Jesus Christ. This is not church hierarchy. But then in Acts 13 we find out that these teachers and prophets in Antioch had been worshiping God and fasting for some period of time. As they were worshiping God and fasting, God spoke, I don't know through who, one of the prophets maybe, and said, set apart now for me Barnab Barnabas and Saul for the ministry I've called them to. And after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. What's going on here? Paul said, I have, I'm not from men. I'm not by men. But this was the release of his apostolic ministry. The start of his first missionary journey was by the word of God coming through prophets and teachers, them coming to agreement, laying hands, and sending them off. Was this from men or by men? No, it's from the Lord. Now, I believe in the laying on of hands when it comes to establishing ministry, not so that the church is, unless I approve, you're not, you know, that, not that type of thing. But when the Holy Spirit's doing something, there's got to be a Holy Spirit sensitive man or what, people of God out there that can recognize what the Holy Spirit's doing and say amen to it. And they're not doing it, God's doing it, but they're agreeing with it. And I would not want to be a leader of the church. Too many things could happen. Too many things. Go. It's not fun unless the Holy Spirit sure helped me a lot. And so 
There, there's the Holy Spirit appointed leadership that you can trust that will recognize what God's doing and say amen to it. Timothy chapter 5, uh, elders who direct well. He's talking nuts and bolts to Timothy, his son. And those elders who are sinning, so good elders, bad elders, this is what you should do. But don't be hasty in laying on of hands. He's talking about making elders. In Philippians 1, 1, we're not turning there, but Paul said, I'm writing to all the saints in Philippi along with two other groups, overseers and deacons. Saints, overseers, and deacons at Philippi. So you have the right to, the blue and the red, those are laying on hands, getting into ministry. On the left, you have the saints, and we have all the gifts of the Spirit flowing, but it doesn't require the laying on of hands and the appointment. Why not? Because the deacon overseer ministries need to receive that kind of confirmation themselves, and the body of Christ needs confirmation for their ministries in particular because they're influenced. You can ordain yourself, but it doesn't work well. <laughs> I, I am a prophet to the nations, thus saith the Lord to me. No one takes this honor on themselves. Now, to kind of sum it up, Genesis 1, the earth was formless, no structure, no design. Was the Spirit of God there? Life was there. It had the power, it had no design. Problem. First creation. You have the power, you have no design. You have the life, but you have no structure. Second creation, the church. It has a form of godliness in the last days, but it denies the power of it. It has the structure, but it has no life. It has the design, but it has no force and power of the Holy Spirit. So, and we have churches that tend to go one way or the other. What in the world would happen? if those two come together by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Do you want the design without the fuel? Do you want the car? Spiffy little car, but you'll never have any gas to put in it. Defies the, the definition of what it's all about. Or do you want the gasoline without the structure, without the design, without the car? What do you want? Which do you choose? Which would you like, the gasoline or the car? Can't have both. Only have one. Do you want the body without the spirit? Uh, worship team, why don't you go ahead and start coming on up and somebody go get Mona if you would. Do you want the body without the spirit? Or do you want to be a puff of wind out there, but you can't talk to anybody and you can't communicate with it and you can't, you, you, you got the life, but you have no structure, you have no order, you have no design. Who here is really, really thirsty right now? I'm trusting that God's gonna make somebody just very, very thirsty. This is clear crystal. This is the best water you'll ever want to drink right here. Nice water, very clean, very pure. I arranged this myself. Now, who, who is thirsty would like a drink? Who would like a drink? Okay, Diane, you'd like a drink? Okay, Jillian, you'd like a drink? Okay, okay, okay. Now, the problem is I can't give you the water and the glass at the same time. I can't give them both, you know. So, I can give you the water or the glass, but I can't give them both. And so, you can have the glass or the water. Which one do you want? <laughs> glass or the water, okay. <laughs> Listen, Proverbs 9 says, Wisdom has built her house. Whenever you see a woman in the Old Testament, be very suspicious. God's talking about his people. He's not just talking about some ethereal thing, I think I'll call her a woman. I think wisdom's a woman. Yeah, she ought to be a woman. Not that. He's talking about his people. He's talking about the church. 
He equates her with wisdom and she builds her house. But not only she builds it, but she has set up its, how many? Seven, seven pillars. What's seven? Strength, perfect strength, complete strength, total strength, wisdom, wisdom. She has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. Here's an Old Testament prophetic look into the future. And there's going to be a strength who said this last week. What good is prosperity without safety? What good is provision if there's no security in order? Well, we don't want wrong security. I go, amen, we don't. But God has married righteousness and peace, structure and life. In your very own body, the spirit is preeminently important. It's not the form, but I'll tell you, your structure sure helps the spirit that's inside. God is doing something in the church in our day. See, around the world, it's, it's just kind of, I, I feel like I'm just waking up to things that have been going on for decades and decades. We see, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, an innocent, tolerant, globalistic, mindset that has opened the door for aggressive, religious, sword-based aggression to capitalize and run through that door. And I think the terrorists are the carriers, but I think Sharia law is the disease. And I don't even think that's the greatest disease. I think the whole I ideology of the Islam faith itself, if I can go that far, I'm going to be bold. I'm going to be bold. Is making its play around the world and God is not surprised by these things. He knew that these would be needed, that would be discovered, that would finance. And he knew that the, the philosophies of men would allow an open door, and he knew all this. And so you can get all the politicians you want, and you can pass all the laws you want, and you can get all the policemen and all the military forces you want, and you can contain the carriers, and you can control the carriers to some degree, but you'll never cure the disease through politics and through armies. But I'll tell you, there's a church that is the cure. And some people have this fading little body of Christ picture that we're going to just hold the fort till Jesus comes back and, oh God, come quickly because we're about ready to give way. And, but that's not it. The Bible says before he comes back, every enemy is going to be put under our feet. Every enemy. It goes way beyond ISIS and Islam. All darkness is going to come under the authority of the church. Paul, who was figuring out, I can decide when I live and I can decide when I die. He was understanding he had power over death itself. Jesus took the keys of hell and of death out of the hand of Satan. And the church itself will be regulating death as it chooses to. And when God pulls the church out, he's going to pull her out at her peak. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. She won't be LeBron James ready for retirement. <laughs> sure. Well, I, don't, I haven't been watching basketball. I don't know. <laughs> but she'll, she'll have just set the best scoring record she's ever made. And God says, okay, now it's time. And she'll go, oh, no, I'm just getting into it. Beware the bride of Christ. She's a powerful lady. And we haven't begun to see the best of it yet. Birth pangs are starting for the darkness, but I'll tell you, birth pangs are starting because the church is giving birth to something. Arise and shine. 
because your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you, risen upon you, church. And the nations will come to the rise, the brightness of your shining. They won't come to you. They're going to come to the bright shining. Who is the bright shining? The Holy Spirit manifesting and demonstrating through the church. I think I grew up with this idea, it's nice if I bring somebody to the Lord. And I've read a couple times where they talk about some man of God bringing a whole city to the Lord. But can you imagine, nations will come. Nations will come. A whole nation coming to Jesus who is shining through his church. I'm preaching, but I, I don't think that's my calling. I'm, I'm stepping, moving forward in the gifts of the Spirit, but I don't think the works of the Spirit and the miracles and whatever else is my calling. I'm pastoring a church, but I don't think that's my calling. I really don't. <laughs> my calling is to build her. My calling is to see this on the face of the globe before I go. Not a man-made oppressive government and control over the people of God, God forbid. I'm not talking that. But I'm talking about Ephesians 4 coming into real form in the body of Christ. I'm talking about life-filled structure as God would have it. I'm looking for a fully formed woman that is now a mom and she can carry her own and she can carry the community and she can carry the state and she can carry and it won't be just us there are millions of bodies like this God's going to raise up around the globe and we get to be one of them and folks if I'm called to this and you're here guess what you're stuck <laughs> you're called to it too we're going to see it working amen y'all agree yeah. amen Amen. Thank you. Let's stand up, would you?